Tonight, President Biden will address a joint session of Congress and unveil his $1.8 trillion American Families Plan. One part of that plan is extending the child tax credit, which researchers estimate could cut child poverty by 45 percent. I want to bring in one of the lawmakers who is leading the fight to make this tax credit permanent and will be at the speech tonight. Democratic Senator from Colorado, Michael Bennett. Uh, Senator, you have been fighting for a long time for this child tax credit to exist and now to be permanent. But when you add it to a bill that includes free community college, free preschool, and a lot of other things, does it get watered down? And does it worry you that what you're trying to get through won't have a chance as part of a $1.8 trillion bill? Well, we, we, we need to make it permanent. Childhood poverty is devastating in this country. We've got one of the highest rates in the industrialized world and the population in this country that is poorest, shame, it's a shame to say this, are American children. So I'm very pleased that the White House uh, included the, um, the, the, my bill in the, in the American Rescue Plan and, and they've included a version of it in this plan, but it doesn't go far enough. We have to make it permanent. And but, I think there are gonna but be some sir, take. You're, you're not answering the question. Okay, ask it again, Stephanie, sorry. There's a lot of other things in that bill, yeah, not just what right. you want. Should the White right. House, should the administration sacrifice some of that to get what you want through? Well, from my perspective, this is the number one priority. I think cutting childhood poverty almost in half is something we should do and we should make it permanent, both for the sake of the kids and the fact that it costs this country a trillion dollars a year to handle the effects of childhood poverty, which we don't handle very well. So from my perspective, absolutely. From their perspective, they have to pass a bill through both the House and the Senate, and they may be weighing different priorities. My hope is that during this legislative process, we're going to be able to demonstrate that there's incredible support for this proposal to cut childhood poverty in half. Chairman Neal, the Ways and Means Committee, put it in his plan. The Chairman uh, DeLauro, the Appropriations Committee, is the, is the leader on the House side. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, says she wants it. Chuck Schumer, Ron Wyden, all say they want it. So this is the beginning of a legislative process. And uh, I hope at the end of it, I don't just hope, we're going to fight like hell to make sure that we make it permanent. Well, then and let's talk about... With respect... Go ahead. No, please. I was just going to say, I mean, there's going to be a, a, a negotiation here in the House and the Senate. No one knows. The White House doesn't know. I don't know what it's going to take to pass a bill through the Congress of this size. And in the end, what it's going to contain. We're going to have to put together a really interesting and unusual coalition to do it. But we need to do it because this is the you know, we, we have utterly underinvested in this country now for decades. And this is our opportunity to start making up for that. Then let's talk about that negotiation, because Congress has already spent trillions, trillions more are proposed, and a lot is needed. Some parts of the economy are struggling, but others right now do feel flush with cash. Right now, we still have a moratorium on foreclosures, while the housing market is up 30 percent from where it was last year. Do you need to be more targeted with exactly where the money's going? I do think it's really important to be targeted, and that's why I've I have rec you know proposed for a long time that we uh, take benefits like unemployment insurance and tie it to the state of the economy. So when the economy is cratering, the UI is increased. When the economy is getting better, the UI uh, is reduced. And you take these questions out of the hands of politicians in Washington and, and, and do what's right for the American people and what's right for the economy. But you're, look, we're never going to calibrate this perfectly. I mean, there's still one and a half million moms with kids that are at home because they don't have child care. There are 1.5 million fewer moms in the workforce today than there were in March. And I think there are, there is a lot of indication that there's still a lot of fear about uh, people's health and, and that's keeping them at home. Look at what's going on in Michigan. So we have to definitely be attuned to what you're talking about, Stephanie. And I, I don't think any of us, I certainly wouldn't want us to do things that disincentivize people going back to work, but we still have to bridge our way out of this pandemic. And I would say just as important as that, we have to make up for decades and decades and decades when all Washington did was cut taxes, 
uh, uh, for the wealthiest people in this country and and fight two wars in the Middle East that lasted for 20 years. We've got to invest in America again. And I think that's what Joe Biden's going to tell us tonight. I hope he does. We didn't have affordable child care in this country long before this pandemic. Senator, I want you to stay with me because I want to bring in my colleague Cal Perry in Louisville, Kentucky, where we are seeing the return of huge crowds to Churchill Downs this week ahead of the Kentucky Derby. But to the point you were just making, like a lot of other places around the country, they're struggling to get workers to come to this big event. Cal, in Kentucky, the minimum wage is $7.25. Expanded unemployment pays a whole lot more than that. People need support right now. So how are they staffing it? Yeah, they're having to be very inventive about staffing this. Part of it is seasonal workers are not coming back. Part of it is workers in general moved away from this area. I know you've been pulling on this thread around the nation. We were happy to get into it here. Chef Dave Danielson has been the executive chef here at Churchill Downs for 10 years. Take a listen to what he says about the staffing issues. Everything from top to bottom, you know, managers, chefs. I normally bring in about 65 chefs. Uh, this year we brought in 42. And just finding those chefs, finding those front house managers, sommeliers, people with kind of a little bit more experience, all the way down to line level, people from our cooks in the kitchens, our concessionaires, people in the stands hawking, dishwashers, garb, you know, so many people. At a normal derby, we have 5,000 food and beverage employees. This year, we're at about 2,000. You know, Stephanie, we will see the effects of this not just here at the track, but things that surround the event on Saturday as well. Uber drivers, that whole sector has changed. People now delivering food and not people. There's a shortage of Uber drivers here in Louisville. And look, some of this is actually a supply chain issue as well. Getting food here was incredibly difficult this year. You're talking about 7,000 pounds of short ribs, 7,000 pounds of medallions, 20,000 pounds of chicken. Chef Dave said when he actually called the suppliers, they thought that he was lying about how big the order was. They thought it was a mistake because large events like this one, as you know, for two years just haven't been taking place, Stephanie. Senator Bennett, you led the bill to raise the federal minimum wage. We all know it didn't go through. But right now, people are getting more government support than if they take some of those lower wage jobs. In the current unemployment, you don't actually have to go out and look for work. So in the short term, do we need to tweak things, maybe even offer partial unemployment benefits? Because you get nothing or you get everything. You can't even get a part time job. Right. Well, (laughs) our unemployment system, Stephanie, is completely broken, and I'm not going to defend it because uh, I've been trying to change it. We've got 50 different systems all across the country, and and they're running software that's 50 years old. So toggling it up and toggling it down, which is what we should do, is extremely hard under those circumstances. We got to fix that. And we also have to make sure that as we come out of this thing, that we're not disincentivizing people from working. But I also think the picture is is much more complicated than that. I mean, we have it's not just a matter of expense in terms of child care, as, as you mentioned on the way uh, to your colleague. It's also that there are many fewer child care workers today than there were before this pandemic happened and much many fewer slots for kids. So I'm not going to disagree that there are cases or that you can show anecdotally that there may be even sectors where it's been harder to get people back to work as a, because of UI. But I think there are a lot of other reasons why. And uh, we are going to get out of this, hopefully, this summer. And and I and I think that as we do, we're going to we should turn our attention to the long term investments that we have to make in our society to make it competitive again. And our economy, uh, it's it's it, it is is showing real wear and tear because of our lack of investment in the American people. That's one of the reasons why when our economy grows over and over again for 50 years, it's grown for the wealthiest people and not for everybody else. And. To, to take it back to the child tax credit, that's why we got to make that permanent. And do you believe we're actually going to tax the wealthiest people? I know that's the plan here, but let's be honest. The wealthiest Americans have the best lawyers and the best accountants, and they never end up paying. Is the language here different than anything we've ever seen before to get these people I, I, to pay? I, I think that the, that the, that we are going to get the people to pay, and it's not just the richest people in America. It's also companies like Amazon that pay zero in 
corporate taxes. And we need to do it. I mean, the, 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 this country is collecting less than 16% of our GDP and revenue, and we're spending, you know, roughly 23%. That's not sustainable. And, and I deeply regret the fact that Washington, D.C., and particularly Republicans in Washington, D.C., cut taxes by the tune of $5 trillion for the wealthiest people in America when we had the greatest income inequality that we've had since 1928. It's inexplicable. It'd be like the mayor of Denver saying, I'm borrowing more money we've, than we've ever borrowed before, but I'm not spending it on parks. I'm not spending it on schools. I'm not spending it on health care or mental health, which we desperately need. I'm just going to give it to the two richest neighborhoods in town. That's exactly what Mitch McConnell's tax policy has been. And that is what we have to reverse and change. And I think we will. Well, now you have a Democrat in the White House, commercial real estate, private equity industries. I'm looking at you. Uh, Senator Bennett, thank you for joining me this morning. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.